the moral argument for the existence of God is intended to prove that some kind of theism is true, most often Christian monotheism. It attempts to do this by showing that morality, specifically objective morality, can only exist if God exists. This argument could be presented as an inference to the best explanation, asking which worldview allows for a better account of morality, but it's most often presented in a deductive form, which looks something like this. If objective morality exists, then God exists. Objective morality exists, therefore, God exists. Or, as another form of the argument, if God does not exist, then objective moral values and duties do not exist. Objective moral values and duties do exist, therefore, God exists. Well, I actually think one of the most compelling arguments for the existence of God is the existence of objective moral values. It has two premises and a conclusion. It goes like this. If objective moral values exist, God must exist. Objective moral values exist, therefore, God must exist. That's it. Now, let's put this in an argument form. If we were to do that, we would say premise number one, if God does not exist, then objective moral values do not exist. Premise number two would then be objective moral values exist. And the conclusion would be, therefore, God exists. So we can argue in the following way, which is on the outline. If God does not exist, then objective moral values and duties do not exist. Two, objective moral values and duties do exist, from which it follows logically and inescapably, therefore, God exists. Now, just to make this argument clearer, I think it's worth rephrasing it with the actual meta-ethical theory it's referring to when it talks about objective morality or objective moral values and duties. The theory this argument is referring to is called moral realism. Moral realism is basically the idea that moral statements can be true or false, and that their truth value is independent of the opinions of any subjects. According to moral realism, objectively true moral facts exist. So a more technically correct and useful version of the moral argument would be something like this. If atheism is true, in the sense that no gods exist, then moral realism is false. Moral realism is not false, Therefore, atheism is not true, which means that at least one god exists. For the sake of this video, I'll be using the word atheism to represent the proposition that no gods exist, because this is how apologists who present the moral argument typically use it, although I've explained in a previous video why I think this terminology is incomplete. In this video, I'm going to discuss premise 1 and how it's typically defended. In the next video, I'll do the same thing for premise 2. But before we examine premise 1, let's first take a step back and get a broader picture of metaethics. This here is a very nice, not too complicated flowchart of metaethics that I've found very helpful. Moral realism, which the moral argument appeals to, is a form of cognitivism. Cognitivism is the idea that moral statements, such as, we ought not torture babies, are propositions which can be true or false. That is to say, they are truth apt. Moral realism specifically is the idea that moral statements are truth apt, and that they are true at least some of the time, independent of the opinion of any subjects, and that their truth value is something we can access. A moral realist might say, for example, that torturing babies is objectively wrong, and they would attempt to give an account of why this is objectively true. Another type of cognitivism is called subjectivism, which is the idea that moral statements are truth-apt propositions, which are at least sometimes true, but their truth value depends on the opinion of one or more subjects. An example of a subjective truth might be the fact that a particular diamond is worth $1,000, that statement may be factually true, but its truth value only exists in light of the fact that subjects value it that much. In quite the contrast to moral realism and subjectivism, error theory is the idea that, while moral statements are intended as true statements, they're all false. 
or at the very least, that it's impossible to know which ones are true and which ones are false. An error theorist would say that, even though we are trying to make true statements about morality, we cannot actually prove their truth value. On the other side of the chart, we have non-cognitivism, which is the idea that moral statements, like we ought not torture babies, are not truth-apt propositions at all, and that they do not aim to be true or false. One type of non-cognitivism is called emotivism or expressivism, which is the idea that when people say things like we ought not torture babies, they are simply expressing their disapproval of it. It's like if I were to say, torturing babies? That statement isn't true or false, it's just an expression of strong disapproval. So those are just a few meta-ethical frameworks that will become relevant as we discuss the moral argument. With all that understood, let's look again at the basic form of the moral argument for God. The argument basically says that atheism is incompatible with moral realism, and because moral realism is true, therefore, atheism must be false, which means that some kind of God exists. For this video, I'll be focusing on premise one and on apologist arguments for why moral realism is incompatible with atheism. In order to show that moral realism is incompatible with atheism, the apologist will typically attempt to show that the atheist's moral reasoning is ultimately without a foundation, because the atheist cannot jump the is-ought gap. Nothing about what is the case necessarily entails what ought be the case. The apologist might ask something like, why is murder wrong? That is, why ought we not murder? An atheist might try to explain that we ought not murder because it is the case that murder causes unnecessary suffering. But the apologist is quick to point out that this just pushes the problem back a step, and the same basic question still applies. Why ought we not cause unnecessary suffering? What is it about the statement, murder causes unnecessary suffering, which logically supports the other statement, we ought not murder? Why ought we not cause unnecessary suffering? Who is to say that we ought not cause unnecessary suffering? Whatever answer the atheist gives, the apologist can reasonably ask, why ought that be the case, ad infinitum? There's atheists that are very moral. Um, the, the question is, can you justify morality without God? And that's the problem, right? It's not, can you act morally? Of course, atheists can act morally. The question is, can you justify what is moral without God? And I say, no, it's just your opinion if there's no God. I mean, it's not good to kill other people. Why not? Because that's the, I mean, that's what most who people said? say. Yeah, but who said? Um, Hitler said it was good to kill other people. Stalin said it was good to kill it. Why, why is that wrong? Why are they wrong? Because they uh, they killed millions of people. I know, but why is killing millions race? of people wrong if there's no God? At this point, the atheist might want to just define the word wrong as that which causes unnecessary suffering. And then, given that starting point, they can observe that certain actions objectively cause unnecessary suffering which would make those actions objectively wrong because they now refer to an objectively real feature of reality, suffering. But, the apologist replies, that starting point, that definition of wrong, is itself arbitrary and not objectively true. So the entire objective moral framework that gets built on top of it is, itself, arbitrary. Why ought we define the word wrong as that which causes unnecessary suffering? What makes this definition objectively true? The subjectively chosen goal of the game of chess is to uh, checkmate the, the opponent's king or whatever. Once that's the goal, and once you assign the properties to the different, um, or, or the moves that are possible to the different pieces, then there is an objectively better or worse way to get to that subjectively chosen goal of playing chess. In a similar way, this morality that we're talking about here on Dillahunty's view is like, here's a bubble of people here, and the people inside that bubble think a certain way. They've decided, they've subjectively chosen not for something like well-being mm -hmm. to be, that's, their, that's like the checkmate. That's their subjectively chosen goal of their morality. Once you've decided that's what we're calling good, 
then there are objectively better or worse ways to get there. That's not objective morality. That's still subjective morality. It's just within that subjective morality, there's objectively better or worse ways to get to the thing in your opinion one should do. And so, the apologist concludes, moral realism is impossible on atheism. In contrast, they argue, Christians can defend moral realism, such as the idea that murder is objectively wrong, on the basis that murder is contrary to the nature of God, which is the objective standard of morality. It is the real, objective thing to which moral statements refer, whereas atheists have no such objective foundation on which to rest their moral arguments. Without God, there is no objective reference point for moral statements. God's nature provides an objective reference point for moral values. It's the standard against which all actions and decisions are measured. But if there's no God, there's no objective reference point. God is the standard of moral values, just as a live musical performance is the standard for a high-fidelity recording. The more closely a moral action conforms to God's nature, the better it is. Some apologists will even go on to say that when atheists make statements like murder is wrong, they're actually stealing morality from Christianity and then refusing to acknowledge that this is where they got it. There can't be any objective right or wrong unless God exists. So when atheists are saying that they have certain moral rights, they're actually stealing from God to say that he doesn't exist or while they're saying he doesn't exist. When they say there is morality, they borrow from the God of Scripture. Wow. We take away what they say is true, and we show them that according to their worldview, they can't know it to be true. So what's wrong with this argument? Why do I think the moral argument fails? In particular, what do I think is wrong with premise one and the way apologists defend it? In a nutshell, the problem is that the same line of questioning that apologists use to disprove moral realism on atheism can also be used to disprove moral realism on Christian theism. The apologist's demand for a defense of moral realism is, to borrow a phrase, a philosophical check that the apologist's own worldview cannot cash. Or, to borrow another phrase, what is sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. The argument cuts both ways. This kind of moral skepticism can be used against any kind of moral realism, not just atheistic moral realism. In general, when someone asks you why, such as why ought X be true, you can, of course, furnish an answer. But no matter what answer you give, the person could simply reply with the same basic question ad infinitum. If you say X ought to be true because Y, the person could reply, okay, so why ought Y be true? Well, because of Z. So why ought Z be true? Eventually, you'll realize that your chain of answers cannot be infinite, and you'll need to figure out how to terminate this chain. However, if you terminate the chain, you'll end up with an answer that is, itself, unsupported and unjustified, which would seem to be a problem. You might instead attempt to make your chain circular, but this would just be circular reasoning, which is typically considered fallacious. So, what are you going to do? How do you address the is-ought gap? How do you avoid this problem of moral skepticism? Philosophers have proposed various ways of dealing with this problem, most of which seem to involve choosing a terminating chain and arguing that it's okay to do this, citing some kind of intrinsic good as the terminating link, or simply by arguing against the distinction between ought and is in the first place. These are all debatable solutions, but in my experience, Christian apologists ignore the problems with their own solutions and focus only on the problems with atheist solutions. They simply ignore the double-edged nature of the sword they've chosen to wield. Just as the atheist struggles to avoid moral skepticism, so too does the Christian struggle to avoid moral skepticism when confronted with the same basic line of questioning. The atheist's problem is one that we've already seen, and the Christian's problem looks very similar. Why is murder wrong? That is, why ought we not murder? Because murder is contrary to the nature of God. So why is it wrong to act contrary to the nature of God? Because wrong means being contrary to the nature of God. So why ought we define wrong in this way? <laughs> 
Just like the atheist, the Christian has no answer. They might choose to say that this just is what wrong means, or that God's nature is perfect and perfect is what we ought to do, but these answers are, of course, unjustified and circular, respectively. Just like any answer the atheist could give for why the word wrong should have anything to do with suffering and well-being. As these two hypothetical conversations demonstrate, the Christian theist cannot terminate their chain of why ought we questions any more convincingly than the atheist can. The only thing Christianity allows the apologist to do is to add more speed bumps in the line of questioning, more links in the chain, before they too are finally forced to admit to a terminating chain, or possibly a circular chain, just like anyone else. A lot of people seem to have this idea that it's okay to just stop at God, but you can't stop at something else because yeah, yeah. you, you can keep asking why. You can keep asking why regardless of what anyone says about anything. I think most apologists simply haven't considered this because they stopped thinking through these issues as soon as they found the conclusion they were searching for. They discovered that atheist morality has a fundamental problem, which can be demonstrated using a never-ending set of why questions, and that's all they needed to hear. They never stopped to consider the damage this tool could do to themselves. The price is $10, but I must warn you, this is no ordinary hammock. Its webbing is a mesh of comfort and evil. You had me at comfort. Ultimately, premise one of the moral argument is, as I said before, a philosophical check that the apologist's own worldview cannot cash. If moral realism is incompatible with atheism, because the apologist can just keep asking why, then moral realism is also incompatible with Christian theism for the same reason. The reason the moral argument enjoys such apparent success is simply because the apologist spends almost no time defending their own moral framework against the very same accusations they level against other people's moral frameworks. They insist that atheists cannot account for moral realism, but they hardly ever give a detailed answer to how Christian theism can account for moral realism, in light of the exact same challenge they levy against atheists. If you simply want to look like you're winning a debate, then the best defense is a good offense. Now, to my surprise, William Lane Craig has actually acknowledged that this kind of infinite moral regress is a problem, not just for atheists, but for Christians as well and that Christians do have to give some kind of account of how Christianity actually solves the problem of moral skepticism. It may well be the case that any moral view will have its explanatory stopping point, its ultimate, uh, which, um, beyond which you cannot go. There will be simply an, an explanatory ultimate. So how does Craig solve this problem? Well, Craig subscribes to a form of divine command theory, in which he believes that moral values are things which reflect God's nature, while moral duties are those aspects of God's nature which God has specifically commanded us to do. So the question is, why ought we obey God's commands? How do you justify this moral stopping point? Craig's justification for why we ought to obey God's commands is, because one of God's commands is to obey God's commands. Suppose you say that the reason we should obey God's commands is because he has commanded us to. In other words, God's commands are self-inclusive. If God has said, obey all that I command you, then that is itself something that he has commanded us. I think it's pretty clear that this answer is arbitrary and circular. Why ought we obey God's commands? Well, because we ought to obey God's commands, of course. That's not the kind of answer that Craig would accept from anyone else whose morality he disagreed with, nor is it uniquely applicable to Christian theism. I could just as easily command my viewers to obey my commands, including my command to subscribe and click the notification bell, because my commands are also circular. I mean, self-inclusive. Do it. This answer also doesn't seem very plausible as an account of what we mean when we talk about morality. Simply obeying someone's commands because they said so, even if this person is very smart and well-intentioned, doesn't seem to have anything to do with situations we describe as immoral, such as when we see someone being mercilessly beaten in the street for no apparent reason, 
or when a Turkish official taunts starving Armenian children with a piece of bread. Situations like these, which we call immoral, seem to be much more plausibly related to some kind of well-being than to simply obeying supernatural commands. Craig's circular answer simply doesn't provide a plausible stopping point in our chain of moral reasoning, except perhaps in the sense that, well, it just kind of feels like I should obey God's commands, because he's really knowledgeable and caring and made us and stuff. Doesn't it? Well, maybe, but it also just kind of feels like we should promote the pleasure and reduce the suffering of sentient beings. Doesn't it? So, in summary, premise one of the moral argument, and specifically the way in which apologists choose to defend it, is an argument that cuts both ways and it can just as easily destroy theistic moral realism as it destroys non-theistic moral realism. If this is your standard for grounding morality, if the only way to properly ground morality is to answer a never-ending set of why ought we questions, then no one can ground morality. Premise one of the moral argument is, at best, a kamikaze premise, and as a result, it does not tip the scale in favor of God's existence. That's all for part one. Make sure you obey my self-inclusive command to subscribe and enable notifications so you don't miss part two.